And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the intersection of faith and reason here on Mother Angelica Way, where it all began back in 1981. And I'm Doug Heck, the gatekeeper for this program. Your email questions are so important to us. We mentioned it right at the top of the show. Send them to us at Spitzer's Universe at EWTN.com. And as we always mention, check out all of Father Spitzer's websites, the Magis Center, Purposeful Universe, and SpitzerCenter.org, which are all basically, we put them on the screen throughout the show so you can catch up on those. And of course, our program is always available on our EWTN YouTube channel and the EWTN On Demand page, ever expanding. Recently added to our On Demand page, a program called Reborn. This is an EWTN original docudrama that uses the parable of the prodigal son to show how a loving God forgives us through the sacrament of confession. You can see it for free 24-7 only and exclusively on EWTN's On Demand platform. You can demand it and it's there. Our topic today, the historical evidence of Jesus taken from Father's new book, Christ, Science and Reason, What We Can Know About Jesus, Mary and Miracles, available through our catalog, EWTNRC.com, All Things Catholic. Book of the Month for November by our good friend, Father Wade Manesis, host of Open Line. It's Stand Firm, Be Strong, a men's Catholic daily devotional of Scripture and Saints, and boy, do we need it now. Speaking of needing now, we have our own Father Spitzer joining him again this week. Great to be with you, and if you'll kick things off with a prayer, that would be great, Father. You bet. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing especially of this ministry and our ability to serve in it. Send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole audience and staff, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. We ask all of these things through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, uh, it's great to be with you again, Father, and uh, we'll get right into it. We've you got a bet. lot of questions we want to catch up on, and we really want to dig deeper into the history of our Lord from, from your book, new book. So, here's one uh, news story that I, th I, I noted because we kind of talked mm -hmm. a little bit about it last week, which was a, a Breitbart story, mm -hmm. which set, notes that the era of corporate media dominance is over. And the person wrote at the oh, time yeah. that the road, right, you were talking about that the last time, road to the White yeah. House no longer goes through 60 minutes, CNN, Fox News, Meet the Press, New York Times editorial board, or the cover of Time magazine. That, now, that road now runs through programs like Joe Rogan, or new media podcasts, talk radio, and social media. Uh, in other words, they're saying yeah. that these things go through we the people, which is a good way of looking at it. And uh, they make the point at the end of the article, uh, this is a very descriptive and obviously opinionated, says that America now sees the naked emperor for what it is, the corporate media, as nothing more, uh, in their opinion, than a left-wing super PAC. And I think uh, you can argue about that particular perspective, but you can't over argue mm -hmm. with the fact that many of the things that seem to be being told to us by the mainstream media turn out to not be true, or certainly to be not true in the way it's presented. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's what happened in the last election. I, I think, uh, um, you know, despite the fact that the media tried to cover uh, Kamala Harris very um, favorably and Trump very unfavorably, it really made no difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the election result was still very heavily in favor of, uh, of Trump. I think uh, that shows that people just sort of discount what's being said. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like looking at these polls. I mean, you couldn't be more wrong mm -hmm. uh, than uh, what uh, the polls were predicting uh, before the election, except for, uh, uh, you know, there, there are a couple of very, very important ones like uh, Atlas, uh, Atlas Intel mm -hmm. uh, and things of that nature, which really did get it right, but they're, uh, you know, they're not connected with a media outlet. Right. And so I think people, you know, kind of are aware, oh, go to Atlas Intel, you're probably going to get, you know, pretty close to what's going to happen in the election. Everything else is 
uh, you know, kind of purposely or maybe just unintentionally biased because they're mm -hmm. asking the wrong questions in the wrong way. So uh, in any case, uh, yeah, I think people just discount uh, uh, major media perspectives. And what happens is they go, as you already said, to, uh, to Joe Rogan and uh, many other podcasters that are really now turning into big opinion formers, mm -hmm. uh, much more so than the, uh, uh, than the media, you know, the, the major me media outlets uh, in, in the days of Walter Cronkite, et cetera. Right. So, um, yeah, I think mm -hmm. you're seeing a huge transition take place. And, I mean, I, I can't think of, you know, uh, uh, you know, you put all this publicity out there, you, you practically control the debate or whatever on a particular subject, and, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody pays any attention to it. They go ahead and do what they want, and mm -hmm. they've found themselves other kinds of uh, news sources. And I think that's where the world is going today, and, right. and I think that's not an exaggeration. I think uh, people have just basically, they discount it, they don't mm -hmm. trust it, they, they recognize the bias right away, and so they, they pretty much uh, go to something else and something new. Right, right, exactly. That's what happens over a period of time when people have access to yep. other information um, than what we're yep. told necessarily from the people we used to believe. Here, let's get to some uh, questions that were sent in to us to uh, kind of sure. catch up because we've done a lot of programs in the last yeah. month or so that we talked about topics. So here's one. Dear Father Spitzer, yeah. uh, are you familiar with the movie The Principal? I'm not. Uh, I don't know if you are, but it, apparently it deals with the no. subject of geocentrism and how it is one of the most well. heated debates of the century. It was produced by a Catholic apologist who believes in the idea. Is there not enough evidence out there that geocentrism is wrong what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, why don't you explain, Father, this from Daniel, well, wh what well, geocentrism actually is. Yeah, geocentrism means that the Earth is the center of the universe. Um, it used to mean the Earth was the center of the solar system, but of course you can't look uh, at that as geocentrism anymore because uh, the idea of the Earth being the center of the solar system has been disproved uh, by a variety of different uh, uh, tests, including not just satellite imaging, mm -hmm. but uh, a, you know a very good test called stellar parallax, which I will not explain to you today. But mm -hmm. stellar parallax, uh, with the proper astronomical equipment, can prove conclusively that the Earth is not at the center of our solar system. Mm -hmm. The sun is at the uh, center of our solar system. Satellite imaging proves that just fine as well. So that part of geocentrism is long gone. The idea of looking at geocentrism from a more universalistic sense, a generic mm -hmm. sense, uh, has come out from a variety of different people. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that isn't true either. I mean, the Earth is not really the center of the universe. Uh, you know, if the, if the universe was a perfectly spherical uh, kind of geometry, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, like a balloon, uh, a very homogeneous balloon expanding, then you could say, well, not only is the Earth the center of the universe, every single star is the center of the universe, everything's the center of the universe, because everything is equivalently center along the surface uh, of a balloon, uh, so you could c consider everything to be uh, the center of the universe. But that's not the way it's intended. Mm -hmm. uh, geocentrism is meant to suggest that uh, the Earth is the center of the universe uh, as, as a whole, a special center of the universe uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that really is not the case either, mm -hmm. uh, because of course, when you look at the, uh, um, you know, we have a, a, a pretty good map of, uh, mm -hmm. of the stars in the universe, and we have a pretty good map of, you know, uh, the evolution of our universe, starting with 13.8 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I hate to say this, uh, but our Earth is a real Johnny-come-lately. Mm -hmm. uh, we're only 4.6 billion years old. Now, if you're going to be a true center uh, of the universe, you're going to have to be, as it were, at, at the, 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 the point of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Now, l let's go back to that balloon analogy for just a second. Uh, you know, the point of the Big Bang is in the center of the balloon. 
you know, so the balloon surface is expanding around it. So the, the only point at which the balloon was in that center, as it were, was when it, you know, was 10 to the minus 33 centimeters uh, in diameter, a very, very small, teeny point. Mm -hmm. uh, and the balloon was kind of, uh, the whole mass of the universe was crunched up into that. But now, of course, the universe has been expanding for a long period of time, and uh, it's been expanding over the course of centuries. So we have a period, you know, of, you know, the, of inflationary era, then the plas plasma era, and after the plasma era is stellar nucleosynthesis era, and then the galactic era. Well, the, the, gala the galaxies that have been formed, right, uh, they started forming, uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe a half billion years uh, after the Big Bang. Uh, you know, and of course, they, it came into full development a billion years after the Big Bang. So we've got a lot of galaxies that have been around for, uh, uh, you know, almost 12.8 billion uh, years. Uh, now, our sun is 4.6 billion years old, and our Earth is 4.5 uh, billion years old, more or less. And so, you know, how could we even be remotely at the center of the universe? The older galactic systems would be more central to the, you know, where the Big Bang, as it were, would have uh, occurred when the universe was much, much smaller. Our universe wouldn't have, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, uh, Earth would not have even come, you know, until billions of years later, right? Almost six, uh, seven billion years later. So uh, what you're dealing with here is, is uh, basically mm -hmm. a misnomer, uh, you know, about what the center of the universe could be. You, you have to look at the center of the universe in terms of space-time, mm -hmm. not just space alone. And, and so anybody who doesn't do that does not understand the Big Bang, does not understand. By the way, we have a ton of evidence for the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have a ton of evidence for the Big Bang, we know that the Big Bang was 13.8 billion years ago, plus or minus about 100 million years. And the reason we know this is not just from the red shifting uh, of the galaxies as determined by mm -hmm. Hubble uh, many years ago, right? Uh, this was actually determined by Father Georges Lemaitre in the original Lemaitre constant. Hubble corrected that, and of course, and now we've had another correction of the Hubble constant many times over, but essentially, uh, we know uh, that the universe originated in a Big Bang, which means that our Earth is a very Johnny-come-lately place, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, 4.5 billion years old, you know, that's a big nothing burger, right? I mean, compared to all these other ones that have been out there billions and billions of years. So that's the first thing. We can't be at, at the center of space-time. In space-time, you must include that fourth dimension in the Minkowski sense. You have to include it in the notion of anything that would be central. Uh, so, you know, again, like I said, the Big Bang mm -hmm. uh, is not just evident from the red shifting. We have lots of evidence uh, of this from uh, the Planck constant, gravitational waves uh, that, that, uh, that we have, the Planck um, um, uh, satellite. We also have the COPE, two COPE satellites, the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe. All of these satellites prove conclusively our universe originated the Big Bang. This would take mm -hmm. me several physics lectures right. uh, to right. get through the whole uh, thing. But uh, trust me, there's not a science, Let me ask uh, a, a, a scientific textbook right. that doesn't present this uh, as a, a verified, right. mathematically verified truth. So, Father. Oh, go ahead, Doug, sorry. No, I was going to say, so, Father, yeah. why, why would somebody posit this? Is, is this really something about physics? Is it something about spirituality? and mankind in, in the, the salvation history that people want to believe it's the center of the universe? I'm just wondering if you had any idea. Well, I, I, you know, I suppose that, you know, maybe to make it a little bit more conformable to, uh, uh, to uh, the Genesis uh, mm -hmm. story, but that's a misreading of, of Genesis. Mm -hmm. You know, Pope Pius Twelfth and, uh, you know, in D Divino Afflante Spiritu says, look, you, you, you can't take, you know, the metaphors uh, that are used uh, mm -hmm. to communicate sacred truths necessary for salvation, you can't turn them into scientific truths. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's a category error. Uh, it's also, by the way, a hermeneutical error. Mm -hmm. It's also a heuristic error. Uh, so, you know, that, 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 that's a complete problem. But now these are just big words for saying we as Catholics are allowed to interpret uh, the scriptures and know that certain things are metaphors and needed to communicate sacred truths necessary for salvation. The Bible is not giving us a scientific truth. Scientific truths are empirical, mathematical, 
uh, methodologically determined facts uh, to give a proper explanation to the physical universe. Mm -hmm. That's not what the Bible is doing. It's not what it is meant for. It's meant for our salvation. That's its purpose, not to communicate science, surely not to communicate a proper empirical mathematical uh, explanation of the physical universe. Okay, th that having been said, mm -hmm. uh, I think that might be one reason why they are doing that. Mm -hmm. A second reason why they might want to do it is maybe to think of human beings as sort of a, a you know, a, a si highest and central reality. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't need the earth to be at the center of the universe in order to think of, uh, you know, uh, um, human beings as being, uh, you know, obviously categorically different from any other animal. It's clear that human beings do things that other animals do not do. Mm -hmm. and, and we've got, you know, obviously very, you know, I have a, a, a you know, a, a very good, uh, uh, well, I, I would say it's a good book on it, uh, <laughs> uh, Science at the Doorstep to God, or in an appendix I begin, I, you know, I explain very clearly what animals uh, don't do right. that human beings do right. do, right. from self-consciousness to rational and abstract thought to obviously religious consciousness to aesthetic, that is to say, a recognition of beauty, uh, you know, to uh, a variety of other uh, things that we do. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you put it out there, and that's going to require a transphysical soul. I think there's really substantial evidence that's out there. Uh, that indicates that our transphysical soul came into being 60,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So what I want to just uh, say is, look, you know, we, we have to keep these categories straight. I can tell you this right now, uh, there's no um, animal on this earth that resembles a human being. A human being uh, is much, much higher in terms of abstract thinking, mm -hmm. in terms of self-conscious thinking, in terms of uh, what I would call um, uh, emotional uh, consciousness that comes uh, from the apperception of truth, goodness, and beauty. There's no animal that really has a sense of conscience, uh, no uh, animal that has a sense of beauty, no animal that has a sense of religion, spirituality. Yes, a, go a dog mm -hmm. can sense a ghost. This is not religion. Mm -hmm. I can go into that in a deeper detail okay. another time. The main thing, of course, that we want to uh, see at the end of the day is, y y you know, right now you cannot let science be science, and, and, and let revelation be revelation, and, and don't, you know, don't try, uh, we don't have to, to, to make false claims, mm -hmm. right, that, that uh, especially false claims that are trying to come under the pretense of science. Mm -hmm. You can't use a Euclidean geomet geometrical system to describe uh, the universe as we know it. As I said, space-time is required. And the reason you have to get that temporal dimension is, in, is that light travels at a finite velocity. Because it travels at a finite velocity, you have to account for the fact that different realities that look like they're just out there simultaneous with us are probably, you know, billions of years old if they're mm -hmm. stars, etc. Mm -hmm. So the idea, uh, you know, then is once we put that space-time together correctly, once we see how, uh, right. you know, that the Big Bang is very much a verified scientific fact, then when we put those things together, it's pretty clear, uh, you know, that uh, right. the Earth is not the center of the universe. Right. And you know what Augustine said a long time ago in that great quote from his book on the, you know, commentary on Genesis? He said, look, there are certain people out there who are truly philosophers of nature, who really do know uh, the orbits of the of you know stars and the you know the positioning of the stars and you know the natural processes uh, that confront us and and of course when they see Christians interpreting their scriptures to say that what they can clearly validate rationally is wrong mm. and interpret a completely wrong doctrine of nature based on their interpretation of the scriptures they make re uh, they make the scriptures ridiculous and they laugh us to scorn right. and that is the problem we just don't want to get laughed to scorn right. by the world we, around us who does right. know physics and science quite well and, for, and, and of course and, using and scripture and to do right, physics and who, is ridiculous. And, who, and who are very happy to find something that's clearly false or something they can hit you over the head with yeah. that then allows them yeah, to dismiss everything else you're saying that's actually true.
<laughs> and laugh and right and mm -hmm. laugh us to scorn while they're at it. Right, right. Yeah, as, as Augustine okay. said. Okay. Yeah. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, Jesus and the apostles were celebrating the Passover at the Last Supper. Why would he pick bread to represent his body, which would have been a mere side dish at the Passover? Jesus is the Lamb of God, and the Lamb of God was sacrificed as for all of us. Wouldn't the real flesh of the Passover lamb help us better visualize transubstantiation? Matthew. Uh, did, uh, why would he use bread? Oh, yeah. well, I think, uh, you know, bread was the common food of, of the day. I don't think he was trying to uh, find something that would, uh, uh, you know, represent the, uh, the transubstantiation necessarily. Mm -hmm. He wanted something that was common to everyone where, you know, a, a rich person wouldn't have any more chance of celebrating than a right. poor person. Now, of course, meat and things of that nature, uh, that, that's a rarer thing, you know, but bread, everybody's got bread. Mm -hmm. But, you know, poor, rich, everybody, it's the most common food in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, at the time, it was uh, the most common food in the world. Wine was very common indeed. Mm -hmm. You could press your own wine from grapes you were growing in your own backyard and so forth and so on. It was a very common drink. Mm -hmm. So the idea of bread and wine is that it is common, mm -hmm. and, and of course, it, it has very important significance in the Old Testament, especially with respect to the uh, Exodus narrative. And so uh, these kinds of symbols are wrapped into it, but the real reason is these are the common um, uh, elements of, of food and drink uh, for rich and poor alike. So when we look at it, of course, we say, yes, uh, we are eating the flesh of Jesus transubstantiated, but the idea of having a Eucharistic host and seeing the flesh that's growing out of it, you might think, well, gosh, why wouldn't we use meat or something? Mm -hmm. or, you know, why would we use, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, wine? Why wouldn't we use something that looks more like blood or something? Mm -hmm. I, I suppose uh, Jesus could have done it, but he didn't. He really wanted the common elements of bread and wine and our faith to know mm -hmm. that because Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, my flesh is real food, my blood is real drink, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in me, and I shall raise him up on the last day. <clears throat> so the idea is Jesus said this to us. Mm -hmm. We believe that his word is true because we not only believe but have really good evidence for his resurrection. And, of course, we not only have good evidence for his resurrection uh, from history and historical exegesis, mm -hmm. but we also have good evidence for his resurrection from science manifest on the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, in my uh, view, um, you know, this is, uh, we can trust him. We can mm -hmm. believe him. If Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, and that's clearly what he means, he could have nuanced it. He could have mm -hmm. said, this represents my body, this is symbolic of my body. Right. But he didn't say anything like that. He said, this is my body. And when you have a, you know, the verb to be, estin, uh, in, in Greek, uh, it's pretty clear. <laughs> this is meant as an identity. Right. So uh, I believe him, and, right. and, I, and I, I know that the reason he did this was to, you know, communicate himself to me, to forgive my sins, uh, to um, heal me from the, the uh, you know, the, the effects of past sin, uh, to basically protect me from the evil spirit by his own presence within me, to transform my heart by his heart, which mm -hmm. is living within me in his real body. So uh, because of that, right, I think Jesus, you know, Jesus essentially just wanted to choose what was common, right. you know, and what right. was common to everybody was bread and wine. Right, and as we know, even with the temple sacrifices, the, the poor people would have like pigeons or whatever, or doves, because, morning doves, sure. because they couldn't afford a lamb. That was not something that they could yeah. necessarily afford. And we think yeah, of absolutely. the scriptures, obviously, you know, in John 6, the, uh, also the idea of, the, you know, our Lord talking in, in John about, you know, at that point, many of his followers left him. Okay, well, if it was just a yeah. symbol, what, what was such a big yeah, deal? Exactly. You know, why would they leave? Yeah, and it, and exactly. even to Thomas, where our Lord says, you know, blessed are those, you know, have not seen and be, but mm -hmm. yet believe. You know what I mean? Kind of a thing. Yes, so. absolutely correct. Okay. okay. Absolutely now, correct. Next up, dear Father Spitzer, my wife and I enjoy your Wednesday night program 
with that Doug Keck guy. It is very insightful and <laughs> educational. Do you have any comments on the authenticity of the upcoming Hollywood movie Conclave? I don't know if you're familiar with this thing. My suspicion no, is I'm that it's another say. attempt to disparage, mock, and distort the Catholic Church's magisterium, similar to the Da Vinci Code movie. And this is from Vincent. Uh, well, are you familiar with it at all, Father, or not? No, I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. Vincent, I'm just uh, lights out on it. Well, I didn't I, even know there was yeah, such a movie. Should, yeah, you should turn <laughs> lights out on it. Uh, we've had a couple. Raymond had a uh, thing on the world over. You can look it up on our on-demand platform. Uh, it's a total distortion of the church. There's a bunch of, there's even some uh, uh, transgender things inside uh, the, the oh. movie, not to give anything away, but you shouldn't see it anyway. And I know even uh, uh, Bishop Barron came out uh, recently as well. So uh, they're right on the money. Their okay. sense is correct. It's, uh, I, I think uh, someone said, uh, I mean, I think Bishop Barron said, uh, uh, and again, Raymond had done, actually done an interview with the actual filmmakers, uh, but uh, he said, this is the New York Times' idea of what a Catholic conclave would be. So that gives you an idea of, 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 <laughs> of, of, of how it would be presented. Right. I, I think that was a, a fair analogy. Uh, we got about five minutes, but let's get another question in. Dear Father Spitzer, our family of 16 have been very enlightened by your wonderful answers to many of your viewers. Our teen grandchildren are now starting to watch your programs along with their parents, so you have really touched a generational gap. God bless. Our son struggles with okay. Asperger's syndrome. He is very knowledgeable and has yeah. a master's degree in teaching. He loves the Latin mass and is very devout Catholic. He was teaching fifth grade but was not interactive enough with the students. The principal told him he did not smile enough. Oh, boy. The school did not know of his condition, and eventually he was fired. Please, Father Spitzer, pray for our child who is 33 years old and give me some insight as to how to deal with his depression after he's been fired. Thank you so much. And may God continue to give you the blessings that you need. And this is Mary. And of course, Asperger's is, is an old uh, reference, yeah. actually. don't really use it anymore, but for, uh, for a uh, yeah, high-functioning. Autistic autistic spectrum. Yeah, yeah. autistic spectrum, high-functioning, who I, I have a son who's high-functioning. He's not asperger -y that that particular way. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, what you mm -hmm. have some thoughts on it? Yeah, I do. I, I think, it, you know, there's uh, right now, you know, the, the main thing is when, when you get, encounter something like that, of course, there's a great deal of disappointment when, mm -hmm. when you get fired. But, uh, you know, so much of the time, uh, the one thing you want to do is it, you, first you've got to put your, your trust in, in, in the Lord. And then you've got to pick yourself up and you've got to go right back at it again. In other words, let's uh, locate a job. Uh, that that would be you know uh, just perfect for him uh, you know maybe uh, in a special education setting mm -hmm. uh, you know he could be a, a very patient and good teacher mm -hmm. uh, you know without ha having you know to you know necessarily uh, you know be present uh, uh, to the children in a more, a more emotional way um, you know so uh, uh, you know there there are many uh, jobs like that where you could be a teaching assistant mm -hmm. or something of that nature mm -hmm. uh, especially you know if you're a teaching assistant uh, in math class uh, because of course autistic uh, kids are generally a lot of them are very good at math mm -hmm. and and uh, you know if, especially if it's uh, a lower um, you know the, the kind of more arithmetic uh, geo geometrical kinds of math mm -hmm. uh, or uh, you know things that have a lot of facts in them like a geography or a, a history class etc mm -hmm. so I mean the, the main thing though is I, I would the first thing I do is take them to a career counseling person mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know they, they have a wide variety of tests they can give and they can actually pinpoint a specialty where he would really excel mm -hmm. and uh, what I would do is just tell them hey you know when, when you hit a roadblock like this, you got to pick yourself up and, and you got to move forward. You can't look oh. back and say what I can't do anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and in my own blindness, I, I have to tell you, uh, I, I, you know, when this hit me, um, you know, it wasn't so much, um, you know, when, when I found out about RP, uh, yes, I was very disappointed, but then when somebody mm -hmm. said, oh, you know, when you, you get to be about 65, you're going to, you know, really go blind. I thought, 65? 
Oh, there's a big difference between 33 and 65. I got some time, you know, so I kind of, uh, you know, uh, had, had a cushion there where I could, you know, really read and concentrate mm -hmm. on my scholarly stuff. But I knew, right. uh, you know, as I was nearing my, the end of my presidency at Gonzaga University, I knew that I, I was, this, is, this is not going well. You know, I'm getting worse and worse. And I just thought, you know, I'm not going to get knocked down. You know, as I lose my powers of sight, I'm going to find ways in which uh, I can make up for that or have some mm -hmm. people uh, help me that I did not have to call on before. As everybody on, in the crowd knows, I've got my eye Joan out there, <laughs> and uh, she's always helped me out uh, in every imaginable way. I mean, uh, she, she types so darn fast, practically smoke's coming off her finger <laughs> and uh, fingers, and she just reads, uh, you know, does all the emails, does the office organization, and, you know, blow, you know she's, uh, the, everybody walks into the office, loves her, and, you know, just, uh, you know, feels like they get, came out. I, you know, thank God she's there. She's EQ for me. So, I mean, I, I got a, I got a three for, uh, you know, you uh, just trying to help me with my blindness. And, and so, you know, the, right. you just, God has his ways. Right. And he can basically, you know, fill in the, the, the gaps. Right. He can help you out. But I go to a career counselor. Right. I uh, think somebody that's a great who has idea. those tests that can right. really pinpoint the, the good talents that your son has. Right. And l there are a lot of talents for kids on the autistic spectrum. You just got to locate them because they right. are localized in very different centers of the brain. Right, so, absolutely. Anyway, and, uh, but they can determine it. Right, mm -hmm. and can be very different one, one to another. It can be very, very different. With yeah. that, we're going to take a break. Absolutely. And we'll come back with much more of your questions with Father Spitzer here on His Universe. So stay with us. And thank you so much for staying with us for part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. Today's topic, we're talking about the historical Jesus from Father's book, of course. And the book is Christ, Science, and Reason, What We Can Know About Jesus, Mary, and the Miracles, of course, available through our catalog. Just wanted to finish up on the one thing, having had an autistic child mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, you know, sometimes you you could be worried about saying something or letting people know, but it, I think in the environment that exists today, certainly inside the church, I think, or mm -hmm. a Catholic school or organizations like that, uh, you should try to be, I, maybe try being up front and say, this is a situation. My son is a wonderful Catholic. He loves the faith. He really wants to do something with it, but you know, these are some limitations he has. Uh, is this something you can work with him on in, in a, this, this particular teaching role or in some other roles and see, as you suggested, that maybe yeah. uh, if the people understand that, uh, uh, then uh, maybe they can work with him. Uh, I, I thank EWTN and Mother Angelica and Michael Warsaw for uh, having a position for my son to work at EWTN's religious catalog. It's been a godsend for him. So anyway. Oh, yeah. uh, Next up, another question. Dear Father Spitzer, I'm listening to an episode of your show on how not to squander suffering. You mentioned the prodigal son who had a moment of self-knowledge and repentance. His good brother, quote unquote, was offended at the unbridled mercy, forgiveness, and love of the father. Who or what, what, who or what saves the older son from his self-assessed sense of virtue when the older son only did was what was expected of him? Okay, let me read that. His good brother was offended at I the unbridled mercy. You you understand where they're going with it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sure. So the the main thing is that um, he himself, the boy, has a choice. Remember that the father comes out to meet him, and the boy is very offended. Right? He says, "Wow, you never gave me so much as a kid goat to celebrate mm -hmm. with my friends, and here this loud of yours comes mm -hmm. back, and and y you give him the fatted calf." You know, so he's, he's really, he reads his father, of course, who it represents God the Father, the riot act. Mm -hmm. And uh, the father just kneels before him and says, son, you've been with me always and everything I have is yours. Mm -hmm. That means that literally the father is giving it all to him right now. Mm -hmm. He has only one request of the son and all the property is that son's. 
and he says, your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. So in other words, you got to go, you got to have mercy on him. Mm -hmm. Let him have a second chance. And that's all I ask, right. that you let him have a second chance. Let us celebrate here. Everything else, it's, it's yours. Uh, you know, you've been with me always. I recognize it. I love it. I love you. I thank you for it. Uh, you know, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Just have mercy on your brother. Don't let him rot uh, just because of anger. Right. And so uh, it's up to him, though, mm -hmm. the answer to your question. You know, the, the father, who is God, represents God the Father, has given everything over to him. All the son has to do is come back into the house and forgive his brother. But he does have to come back into the house and forgive his brother. Mm -hmm. And and to have that mercy might be a difficult thing, but I mean the reward is overwhelmingly fantastic. All the property belongs to him. Right, and after all, because the older brother would normally be the one who would receive it anyway in, in, in that inherent in yeah. that tradition. I was wondering, sometime I used to think, and, and I'm not sure it's correct anymore, I used to think that in some ways it's kind of like the, the younger son is, is almost like the Gentiles or the pagans and those who have been living that outside of, of, of the church, of the Jewish religion, etc. And the older brothers are like the mm -hmm. Pharisees. And, you know, the idea that we've been here all along following the law and doing what we're supposed to do, and you're showing all this mercy to these people mm -hmm. who really have never listened to you, God, and now you come back and you, and you want to treat them as equals with us when we're the we're the heirs, heirs of Abraham, so to speak, and, and who are these people yeah. to come back in? Well, certainly that's another parallel mm -hmm. uh, that you could apply to it. I think N.T. Wright might actually do that. Mm -hmm. But the main thing, though, is the, the first line of meaning is really, uh, you know, the, the younger brother was kind of, well, in every sense, a sinner. I mean, you could right. actually say a rat to his brother. You know, he really did scoop the inheritance right out from under the older brother who had right. the right of inheritance before him and then he takes it all off and squanders it I mean that's pretty rotten thing to do right. and so I mean that's uh, that does need some forgiving mm -hmm. uh, because of course he shames his family and and right in front of the Gentiles because he has to go if he's going to work with the pigs he has to be on a Gentile farm right, in right, this foreign right, land right, that's so I mean it's just you know it's terrible stuff that he's done and how he's disgraced everybody uh, and his family and disgraced his people and shamed and disgraced God with all his horrible actions. Now, that needs some forgiving. And right. what the father does is he forgives him and gives the older son a good example. I mean, the father has been harmed the most. Mm. And he forgives him, but he doesn't tell his son he has to forgive him. He just says, look, you know, I'm going to give you I everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm, but I'm telling you now, you got to let this kid back into the house. You got to give him a second mm -hmm. chance. Mm -hmm. I've given him a second chance. You know, just do that, and everything I have is yours now. Mm -hmm. So that's the promise, and it's really up to the older right. son. We don't know what he does because Jesus leaves it hanging, just because. And of course, you are absolutely correct that um, the older son does represent the Pharisees, mm -hmm. and it's Jesus' uh, definite uh, a metaphor for the, the Pharisaical school. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, no question, okay. uh, he's, he's speaking to the Pharisees, and it's, he's really challenging the Pharisees. Right. You know, you make your choice. You, if you want to be merciful, you're going to inherit, man. You're going to inherit. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to be merciful, mm -hmm. and you just want to pound these guys into the ground, right. you're not going to inherit. Um, so, you know, d you know that's, he leaves it there. And we're not given an, an answer right. what the older son does. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's because they don't, they're not appreciating all the mercy God has shown on them to begin with. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So uh, let's see. One last question, I guess, before we get to the book. Dear Father Spitzer, why do atheists claim that the theory of evolution disproves the God of the Bible? Cannot God create any way he wished? And if it is a time issue, doesn't science now say that time is an illusion? And now is not the same for, <laughs> I'm just reading what it says here, time is an illusion, and now yeah. is not the same for everything in the universe. So whether thousands or billions of yeah. years, uh, it really does not matter, correct? Cliff. Well, Cliff, uh, time is not an illusion. Uh, time is very real. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and it does have a significance, and that significance is expressed generally in, the, in what we call the theories of a special and general relativity, mm -hmm. which I won't get into today. <laughs> but yes, time is very real. It makes a difference. If time weren't real, Cliff, uh, by the way, by time we mean what's called a non-contemporaneous continuum. Mm. A non-contemporaneous co continuum has earlier and later in the continuum. So, uh, whereas a, a simultaneous continuum would be space. Space exists at a particular point or many particular points of time, but the temporal continuum, uh, where it's a, a spatial continuum is continuous, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, contemporaneous, an, uh, a temporal continuum is non-contemporaneous. Now, why is uh, this important? Because, of course, in, in a non-contemporaneous continuum, let's suppose we say there was no non-contemporaneity between Elizabeth uh, uh, alive and Elizabeth dead. Then Elizabeth would be alive and dead at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is a contradiction. But Elizabeth can uh, die and not be in a state of contradiction with her life. So in other words, uh, you know, the, the two of them are separated by non-contemporaneity or what we call a non-contemporaneous continuum and that's what we mean by time. That's beside the point though I get your your question. Uh, you, you know, you're saying does evolution disprove God? Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <coughs> your instinct is absolutely uh, correct because when you look at uh, evolution, it is a way of looking at how the cre <clears throat> creation <clears throat> is unraveling, right? So we can see over the course of time that there's all this kind of development and so forth <clears throat> that happens over time. Mm -hmm. Now, th th does that disprove uh, that, uh, a creation at the beginning of time? No. As a matter of fact, uh, evolution assumes that there has to be a beginning mm -hmm. because you can't go back infinitely, um, you know, in, in, with what we call uh, non-contemporaneous um, uh, 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 values. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not going to get into a Hilbertian proof, but the main thing is, uh, 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 you know, having an evolutionary process presumes there is a beginning, uh, not only of the evolutionary process, but a beginning of physical reality itself. And that is actually implied, you know, by a series of other kinds of evidence that I won't go into, but there is a mm -hmm. good amount of evidence from Bordovalenkin and Guth proof, from the entropy right. evidence, variety of other things, uh, <clears throat> that there has to be a beginning <clears throat> of our universe. Now, and a beginning even of a multiverse. Prior to that beginning, the physical reality, whether it be our universe or a multiverse or whatever, physical reality uh, would not exist. Mm -hmm. It would literally be nothing prior to the beginning. Now, the one thing we know about nothing is it can only do nothing. <clears throat> Therefore, mm. when physical reality, uh, um, you know, was nothing prior to the beginning, it could never have moved itself from nothing to something <clears throat> because it was nothing and could only do nothing. So what does that leave us? Something else, <clears throat> something beyond our space and time, something beyond physical reality had to move uh, physical reality from nothing to something. Literally had to create it out of nothing. And that something that has to do the creating that leads to the evolutionary process has to be uh, what we would call a transphysical reality, that is to say a transcendent reality who is highly intelligent that sounds like mm -hmm. a creator or God to me. So the point is pretty mm -hmm. clear, uh, evolution uh, in as much as it presumes, uh, uh, you know, um, a beginning of, uh, of an evolutionary process. And, uh, you know, the physics itself uh, of the universe requires a beginning because of BVG, a, a bar of Lincoln Guth proof, mm -hmm. because of entropy and other kinds of things, uh, presuming a beginning. Uh, you're going to have to have some kind of a creator right. outside of the space-time continuum that supports evolution. Right. So your instincts are, are correct, uh, Cliff, uh, so you, you okay. can pretty much be clear that g the existence of God, the existence of a creation, the existence of an intelligent creator that uh, puts in all the conditions needed for an orderly evolutionary process, right. it's all consistent with evolution itself. Right, and God's not an illusion either. So let's get to the 
yeah. book, uh, <laughs> right. page 58, Christ, Science, and Reason, Historicity, mm -hmm. and talking about, you, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the canonical gospels portraying Jesus and the Gnostic gospels. Uh, what, yeah. wh when you say Gnostic, what do you mean? Uh, well, uh, gnosis just means knowledge, but in this case it means special knowledge. Mm -hmm. So um, there are, you know, a group of people out there who consider themselves to be pretty smart and to, you know, have a special access to uh, God's uh, revealed truth, uh, kind of, I won't say Scientology, mm -hmm. but, you know, <laughs> kind of like I, I, I know all this stuff and I've got this special revelation, this special knowledge. And uh, it was revealed to me because, uh, you know, I'm really good and I'm really smart. So then uh, people, these, this group of people uh, who, you know, are Gnostics, who have this special revelation, come along and say, well, we got to, um, you know, um, you know, there's, you know, Jesus is just too vanilla here, uh, you know, uh, for us. We, we're going to have to uh, uh, basically uh, amp him up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, they're making, you know, Jesus into sort of, a superman mm -hmm. um, rather than a, um, a, a, a you know a, a humble messiah mm -hmm. who has the divine power to raise the dead and to you know heal the blind and the lame etc so he, he, you know he, they want to change his whole uh, appearance from a humble lover to a powerful uh, almost arrogant and, and brash a kind of a, uh, administrator of divine power. Mm -hmm. So in some of the Gnostic infancy narratives, right, Jesus, you know, a kid bumps into Jesus on the playground, mm -hmm. so he has to kill him, you know, or Jesus happens to be passing by some nice clay pigeons, and he touches the clay pigeons, and they fly away. Well, it's all ridiculous mm -hmm. shows of power, which have nothing to do with the humble Jesus, mm -hmm. the loving Jesus, the healing Jesus, the messianic Jesus, of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you look at that and you go, well, what did the Gnostics know that the apostles didn't know? Why did they consider themselves to be so special? Because they were arrogant, basically. They basically, you know, the, had themselves uh, uh, talked into believing that they be belonged to a cult that could, uh, you know, interpret things and po portents and so forth, you know, in a very special way because of their great intuitive and intellectual powers. And so they came up with these ridiculous kinds of scenarios, uh, you know, that, that sort of embellished the Gospels. But they always embellish the Gospels in some sort of dramatic way, overly dramatic, melodramatic way, as well as, of course, mm -hmm. with a, uh, um, you know, a kind of a, a, you know, power over love viewpoint, prestige, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and kind of vanity, uh, you know, kind of uh, outlook as well. So uh, it's not the real Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when you compare the two of them, and the miracle accounts in the Gnostic Gospels are so over dramatized mm -hmm. and so overly, you know, not the humble Jesus who's trying to just heal people and get his doctrine, you know, and, and, you know, of compassion out there and, and manifest. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, you know, it's kind of like this power guy who's saying, hey, look at me and you better watch right. out. Right. If you don't believe, I'm telling you, you're going to get it. And uh, here's an example. I'm going to fry this kid over here, <laughs> and that'll give you enough sign that you're uh, you better obey. Right, <laughs> Jesus right, never did right. anything of the kind. So you can almost, you know, aside from the fact that they have second, third, and fourth century datings, mm -hmm. the Gnostic Gospels are just such a different Jesus. You can identify well, him within five seconds right. after starting to read the Gospel. Right. Well, maybe they, they were just embarrassed. I guess maybe he he would, didn't live up to what they yeah. thought. Uh, uh, Jesus should be, or a demigod should be. That uh, you know. So uh, that's right. You, you talk yeah, about yeah, yeah, exactly you, right. That humility speaks convincingly about the reliability of witnesses and the authors. The tone of the gospel is just right. What do you mean that? The tone of the gospel. Well, is just well right. I mean, you know. Uh, well, uh, first of all, it's pretty humble in the miracle accounts. It's very humble, uh, you know, in Jesus's, you know. Uh, uh, dealings with his disciples, his friends, the people he heals, right? He's not out there being an overbearing uh, mm -hmm. person at all. Uh, you know, he's, he's the one that goes right into the heart of, you know, the, the tax collector's, uh, you know, dens and sort of pulls mm -hmm. these guys out and says, hey, I want, you, I want you to be family to me. I want you to be 
one of my disciples. I said, this is kind of the, the, the real humble Jesus. But and that, that's a <clears throat> key sign to me mm -hmm. that love and humility are more important than power and aggrandizement. But the second thing is, uh, when you look at the Gospels, it, Jesus doesn't cloak over um, the bad news. Jesus mm -hmm. says, you know, there's going to be the cross. Right, right. And if you're going to be one of my disciples, you're going to have to come follow me in the cross. This is not the gospel of prosperity, right? You're going to be rich if you follow me. And just uh, do this. All you got to do is pray, and you are going to be fabulously wealthy. Mm -hmm. Fame and fortune will be yours. Now, of course, you think about that for a second, and you go, wow, that doesn't sound like Jesus. Or why did Jesus have to talk about the cross all the time? Mm. Why did he actually have to undergo and endure the cross? What's this stuff about suffering? What's this about offering suffering up? You know, why is this coming out? This doesn't look like great news to me at all. And why does Jesus not just conquer all these bad guys? I mean, how come he leaves them free, free enough to choose to persecute them? Why didn't he just do what he needs to do and zap them, you know, and so forth? you got to admit, you know, Judas probably was just, you know, couldn't believe that, that Jesus was, you know, to him, you know, being such a weakling. Mm -hmm. You know, he should have been out there, you know, dealing with the other uh, guys and, you know, uh, you know, doing a little razzle-dazzle. So the, the point is pretty clear right. that, uh, you know, um, uh, when, you, when you look mm -hmm. at it, uh, they, they just have this perfect tone. And right. I always thought, you know, boy, you know, if I were really set on an apologetical, you know, uh, uh, you know, agenda, and I really wanted to convince, maybe, you know, if I didn't have Jesus as my example, I'd take out that part about, well, just sell everything you have and mm -hmm. give to the poor, and then come follow me. Like, what? what? You know, th this is not a, Jesus, I, I got to give you a lesson in pu public relations here. This is, not <laughs> right. the, this is not the right way to approach this. If you want more converts, quit talking about this poverty and simplicity stuff. Talk, right. Quit talking about the cross. Quit talking about you got to forgive people. 70 times 7, you should just say, I forgive you one time, the second time you're gonna get it you know I mean I mean it's a, the, the keep you know I know I say this you know tongue-in-cheek but I have to tell you at the end of the day when you look at the way these could have been written mm -hmm. the influence well, of Jesus right you see their sincerity to want right. these apostles and evangelists sincerity they want to follow him they want to follow him even though it's gonna get them a lot less converts they're gonna get the right converts right. who are looking for the truth and looking to follow our Lord. Well, you say here, they were written not to gain readers' approval, but rather in a challenging, almost off-putting way to help us towards salvation. That's right. So Jesus wants us to purify, uh, you know, I've got this little problem called egomania, mm. right, and impatience. And, you know, Jesus says, you know, Spencer, I, 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 you know, I hate to tell you this, you're going to have to give up a lot of that egomania and you're going to have to give up the impatience so that you can really be uh, in, in, uh, in a transparent, loving, self-giving, uh, compassionate relationship with everybody in the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, and basically Jesus is saying, is that all right by you? And of course I'm going to say, that's all right by me. I mean, uh, you're the master. If you say so, uh, that's what I'm going to do. So, I mean, that's, that's my, my, my viewpoint, but mm -hmm. I know that his view of love is right. I know that his view of love is the only way we will have peace in the world, is the only way we will have justice in the world. I know that his view of love and forgiveness is the only way we're going to stop the cycle of vengeance beginning vengeance and violence beginning violence. I know he's right. I absolutely know he's right. But he says it to me, and I know he's, he's, he's not just the Messiah. I know he's the Son of God. And I've got enough evidence for that uh, to be utterly convinced myself. But his word matches who he is. And I know that the path that he recommends is perfect for the world and our needs and uh, the, not just the healing of the world, but the way, the path to a better world, a world with more compassion and not uh, a, a world that is completely dominated by the divisions that we see today because we separated ourselves so much from him. 
Right. And as you say here, uh, you quote the evangelists, you say that uh, they were more interested in, in, in helping souls rather than winning converts. Their goal was to help those exactly. souls. Exactly. Not to, not to have notches on their yeah. belt on, on attracting more and more people with telling people what they wanted to hear, which is what, of course, the the great mm -hmm. uh, you know concern is in the society we live in today, where people are being told what they'd like to hear, their itching ears, than than what the truth is. With that mm -hmm. said, the truth is we're out of time, and so you have to uh, give <laughs> us your blessing on the way out the door. That would be great, Father. <laughs> great, and bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God send His Holy Spirit down upon you to see the rightness of His Son's message that reaches out to us in the Gospels, reaches out to us through the church, reaches out to us through His moral teaching, His doctrinal teaching, reaches out to us in the truth that's presented just right, just right to bring us into the fullness of joy and eternity in His kingdom, Father and Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well. We'll see you next week. And don't forget, all the Father Spitzer's books and DVDs are basically available through our EW10 Religious Catalog. Check them out. And then uh, next week, we'll continue with the historical evidence of Jesus from his book and EW10's bookmark, Stand Firm, Be Strong, a Men's Catholic Daily Devotional of Scripture and Saints. And that's by Father Wade Menesis of, of Open Line fame. And we've got a program coming up, Understanding Divine Mercy, five-part miniseries featuring Father Chris Alar, helping you understand the loving mercy of Jesus begins Monday, November 18th, runs all week long through the 22nd at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Doug K. We'll see you next time right here in Father Spitzer's Universe. Be well.